here's a couple of examples of Tibetan. Uh, I think it's on. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Here's a couple of examples of Tibetan spindles. These are both made of cherry. This part's called the whirl. The whirl's cherry, both of them. And the shaft is maple on both of them. They look about the same, don't they? This one has uh, some sapwood in, but other than that, they look the same. This one I'm going to attempt to sell tonight for $40. This one I'm going to throw away. What's the difference? I'll show you. Uh, these spindles have to spin well. Let me do this one first. If you spin it, can you see it's just a slight vibration, almost no vibration. Can you see that? I don't know if it's visible. I don't know. Yeah, can you see that? It's spinning. Yeah. yeah. Now it should spin, should spin 30 seconds. Yeah, I just gave it a spin. It should go 30 seconds or longer. Um, some some I make go for over a minute, some go a little over 30. Some go less than 30. If they go less than 30, I don't like to sell them, but I might. <laughs> no, I, I don't usually. Uh, there are reasons I do, and I'll talk about that later. Okay, this one. Now watch this one when you spin it. Well, maybe I will sell it. No, here we go. Can you see it? Can you see the difference? Maybe you can't. But I, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a lot more vibration. There's a lot of vibration. Now you can still spin with that. I mean, you can spin yarn with that. That's, that'll work. But I can't sell it. Can you do the camera up on top? I want to see the whirl. If you can see the whirl. Yeah, can you, the overhead one. Yeah. Well, you can't really see it there. But the whirl, when it slows down a little bit, you'll see that it's wobbling back and forth quite a bit. And people, yeah, can you see it there? I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. Maybe you can't. But well, when it slows down more, it'll be easier to see. Can you see that's wobbling? Can you see the wobble? Yeah, you don't want that. That's, that's bad. This one I'm going to throw away. What's that? I'm going to talk about what goes wrong. There's a couple things that go wrong. So um, that's, that's one of the reasons I like to make these spindles, though. It's because not only do they have to look good, but they have to work well. You know, if you're making a, a, ta a, a box, for example, and you're putting a finial on it, the finial's off a millimeter, nobody's going to see it. But this, if this is off a millimeter, it, I, I, you can't sell it. It's going to wobble too much. So what are they used for? They're used to spin yarn. So I'm just going to show you. I, I'm not good at this, but I will show you how people do it. Basically, um, you, get, you get it started by sometimes people will tie a little leader on, just some yarn that's already been turned. And they kind of spiral up the shaft. And then they attach it to some, to some uh, wool. This is alpaca, by the way. So basically what you do is you kind of spiral it up here. Spin this, just kind of let it spin, and you, and you. Well, I'm not very good at it, like I say, but you just draft this out. People that are good at it just keep the thing spinning all the time, and keep drafting. Actually, I'm better at this when I'm sitting down and nobody's watching, but I can't prove that to you. Anyway, you just keep drafting out, and once you get it out of ways, like an arm length, you just uh, wind it on. You keep going. Now that's a little bit thick there, but that's all right. I can't knit anyway, so it doesn't matter. OK, well, you get the idea. That's how it works. So um, oh, here's a bad spot. So here I'm going to kind of pull it apart and re-spin it. And I can probably fix that. I don't know why I'm never going to use it, but I feel better about it. OK, that I could clean up a little bit. But you get the idea. That's how it works. Okay, yes. Yeah. Well, it's not so much that it doesn't spin long, it wobbles too much. I don't want too much wobble. It might not make much difference. Uh, people will spin with these that wobble this bad. It's just I'm not going to sell them like that. Um, I, I, I keep these to spin on them, actually. I have like five or six that are wobble about like this, and um, maybe a little worse than that, some of them. I spin on them. You can spin on them. It's just you don't want to sell those. OK, well, so that's what? It's a tall top, yes. It's a tall top, but it doesn't spin as well as a top, because if you try to spin it and let go, it's just going to fall over. Too tall to be a top. OK, 
So um, let's go ahead and get started on how to make these. Um, yeah. I'm going to. Just be patient, Pete. Be patient. Um, let me uh, give you a handout. Let me just kind of I need to keep one for myself. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the history of how I got into this in a bit. But okay, first question is. So yeah, let me let me say this is there's three parts. You have to turn three parts. You have to turn the whirl, that's this part here that keeps it spinning. The shaft, that's this part. I think some spindle makers make this part and this part all one piece. I don't. I make this as a separate piece, the tip. So I have three pieces to make. That's what we're going to do tonight, make those three pieces. So the first one I'm going to make is the whirl. So the question is, uh, is this going to be on the website, John? Yeah, it will be. Yeah, I'll... I'll Okay, yeah, we'll put stuff on the web. There's a handout I'm giving. We can put that on the web, though. Yeah. Okay, so the first question is, how big do you make the whirl? Okay, when you cut your blank, you want to make sure it's the right size. Well, that's a simple, there's a simple answer. Here it is. I'm going to reveal, now this is my secret, you know, so other spindle makers probably don't know this formula, but I know it. The diameter is two times the fourth root of six times the moment of inertia you want divided by pi times the height of the whirl times the density of the wood. I use that formula. That's a, I, I have a spreadsheet. I use it. So, <laughs> so here's what I do. Here's what I do. I cut a square about an inch thick. I, oh, this is one thing nice about these two. You don't have to buy uh, um, blanks. You just buy one inch boards. One inch boards does it all. That's all you need. So I cut blanks, um, I cut them two by two if the wood is fairly dense. Now for cherry, two by two is marginal. So anything less dense than cherry, I'd make it two and a quarter, two and an eight, something like that, square. Okay, so that's how big I'd make it. And then I use that formula, and I usually measure it. I measure the dimensions, figure out what the density is, and I use this formula. But if you don't want to use the formula, that's fine. I'll talk about this formula in a minute. It's a little easier to use. But here's what I'll tell you. If you're making, uh, if you're making one, and you're using wood that's very dense, like lignum vitae or ebony, something like that. You make it somewhere around, well, it, lignum vitae, you want to make it about 1.6 inches diameter. For uh, ebony, the density is about 1. You make it about 1.75. For cherry, the density, I don't remember what it is, 7.7, something like that. You want to make it around 2 inches. Okay, But you can do it with a little trial and error to do it. The reason you want to have, make sure, and th this is to get the right moment of inertia I. The moment of inertia is what keeps it going. And if you make that too small, it won't spin long enough. If you make it too large, it's too hard to spin. People don't like it. And just from experience, it turns out they want I to be about 30. And these, these are in grams and centimeters. So I'll, I'll say a little more about that later. OK, anyway, what I want to do is I want to turn the whirl. So um, I start with the blank. First thing I want to do is put a tenon on it. So I want to do that. OK, so mark the center, however you mark the centers. I usually just do it this way. It's it's fast, not completely accurate, but it doesn't matter. The other thing you want to do is put your glasses on. And we'll so I'm just going to put it on center. Get that in the mark. Make this a little bit different from my lathe. Okay. Uh, do we have any other? Okay. So what I want to do is I just want to knock the corners off, make it approximately round. Spring's gone. No, 
this pink? Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to put this over. That should work. By the way, I have some, there were some spindles <laughs> over there um, that I made in various woods. So if you want to have a look at those, you can. We can pass them around if you want. I don't care. But uh, let me warn you, some of them are John Tolberg's, too. He's been making them. Let me just warn you, if you, if you break them, then you pay for them. <laughs> OK. All right, so here we go. I just want to cut the corners off, make it, get it close around. And then, uh, about there, then put a tenon on it here. So I'm just using a bowl gouge. Um, this one's an Ellsworth gouge, but it doesn't really matter. You can use anything. Okay, and then uh, let me make the tenon so it fits the chuck a little better. I'm just using Ellie Avisera's, uh, I think he calls it a beading tool, I believe is what he calls it. But you can use whatever you want. Just get a nice um, tenon. And when I'm doing this at home, here's what I do. I don't turn the lathe off. I just do this. And I stick the next one on. So you can just go, you know, I have it marked. I don't have this one marked, but just put it on there and and I do the next one. Okay, but I'm not going to do that tonight because I'm only making one. But usually I'm making a half dozen or something, so I save a little time that way. Tonight I'm losing time that way. Okay, so got this. Have to chuck it in. I'm using one of my favorite chucks. That chuck I got at the uh, Grizzly uh, tent sale, either this year or last. I have two of them. I don't remember which one's which. But um, $50, and it works great. <laughs> if I would have paid 20 I could have gotten one that worked even better. <laughs> First liar doesn't have a chance, does he? Next time I want to go with you. Okay, the next step I do on this is uh, I want to make it look like this. Okay, so this, as you can see, is the start of the whirl. I've just got basically the, let's see, can you see it there? Yeah. I'll just hold it right there. So you can see that I've got basically the shape started, and I have the top finished. It's sanded everything. It's ready to go, and there's a hole in the top, but not in the bottom. So that's what I want to do first. Let me just pass that around. OK, so I'll use the bowl gouge. I'm only going to use this gouge on the, this bowl gouge on the uh, squirrel. So what I'm going to do first is just, just square this up a little bit and then start the shape. Cherry cuts really nice. That's why I wanted to use cherry. And then make the shape on the top of the whirl. I do it two ways. Sometimes um, if you look at this, I have a little raised spot here in the center. Can you see that? Sometimes I don't put that in. Sometimes I do. It just depends on how I feel and what, how lazy I am. By the way, this is a small piece, so you might think everything's real safe here. You don't have to worry about wood come flying off. Here's a squirrel I was making the other day. And there was a crack in that I didn't notice and just went flying off. So even though it's a very small piece, you still want to exercise 
you know, the standard safety thing is be careful. I should wear a face mask and, and the, whole, the whole business. And you shouldn't sit there. OK, so now I just want to get this, uh, this face nice. So um, I'm going to go ahead and leave the thing in the center there, like on that one. So I'll just do a pull cut here. That's it. OK, now I need to drill it. Drilling is critical. Um, if you get the hole crooked, you're going to have a bad spindle. So drilling is very critical. A lot of people drill by, they put, the, they put the chuck in, they don't tighten this, they put it up here, and then they let it center, and then they tighten it and go. I don't do that. I used to do that. But I think this works a little bit better. Uh, it's a good idea to kind of just put a little uh, dimple there where the center goes. So I'm just going to just put a little dimple in it. OK. And now what I have, and I forgot what these are called, but uh, I got this at Harbor Freight. Basically, let me know what these are called. You use a center drill. And it works pretty good. And it's a quarter inch. I'm doing a quarter inch hole. You have to move this out of the way. And I go ahead and tighten it. And then, yeah, OK. I'm going to go ahead and start the hole. And then I finish it with the regular drill bit. Uh, quarter inch, quarter inch hole. Now, the reason I'm only, I'm only going to drill halfway through, or half an inch through, and the reason is because when you drill, the bit's going to wander a little bit. And if you drill all the way through, you're going to get it wandering more when you get to the end. And if you drill halfway through, turn it around and mount it so that that hole has to be true, then you drill from the other side. I'll, I'll, when I get there, I'll explain that. So I'm only going to drill half an inch in. OK, so right there is the start. So this turns, I assume it's like the Powermatic, where it's 16 turns per inch. Is that right for this one? Does anybody know? Well, that's what I'm going to assume. So I'm going to turn it eight times. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. If it starts to seven, I'm going to pull it out and make sure it's clean, because you want to get a good cut. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think that was actually seven. There's eight, and a little bit more is fine. So you want a little more than a half an inch, basically. OK, the next step is to sand it. And what I decided I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to sand it. If I remember to bring my sandpaper. I thought I did. Oh, here it is. Um, I know sanding is boring. So what I'm going to do is while I'm sanding, I'm going to talk about marketing a little bit about marketing these things, how I got started, and how I got started making these, because I should be able to talk and do that at the same time. So let me ask this. If you were making, if you were turning things, you wanted to sell them online, where would you sell them? What website would you sell them? Would you make your own website? Would you sell them on uh, eBay? Would you sell it on Etsy? Etsy, yeah, that's what I would do too. That's what I do. Um, why not eBay? Somebody tell me what's wrong with selling on eBay? What's wrong with eBay? Well, there's fees on all of them. There's fees on any website you sell on. So fees could be a problem. I don't, I've never sold on eBay, so I don't know. But I'll tell you why I would never sell a turning on eBay, or probably never sell one, is um, people who go on eBay are looking for bargains. You don't want to sell where people are looking for bargains. There's a website called Etsy. It's on the bottom of there. Etsy.com, and that's for uh, handmade things. That's where you want to sell your stuff. You want to sell it where people are looking for handmade things. When they buy something handmade, they realize that they're going to have to pay more for something handmade than what they would pay at Kmart. And so um, it really doesn't make much sense to go to some place like eBay. It really makes a lot more sense to go to Etsy. Um, on Etsy, if you look at the Etsy website, you can do a search on uh, bowls. Wooden bowls. I did that this morning to see how many there were. Guess how many there are on Etsy? Guess. How many? Not that bad. 
there's only 8,000. But here's the question. If you're trying to sell bowls, and there's 8,000 of them out there, how do you stand out? What do you do? Um, <laughs> what about wood pins? How many wood pins do you suppose there are? If you go to Etsy. How many? 5,500. Um, how many uh, spin tops, little, little tops that you spin, toys? 7,500. At least that's what I wrote here. Um, how many Tibetan spindles? 20. And most of those, and one of them was mine, which I already sold. I mean, it wasn't even for sale. And I don't know how many of them were actually still for sale. Okay, I've sanded it. I sand it down to 2,000 grit. You don't have to sand it that far, but I do just because I can tell people I do, and it sounds like I'm making better quality stuff. Well, actually, I, I think it does do a better job. So I got it to 2,000. looks pretty good. So that's that step. Next step is to turn it around. So I'm going to take it off. I'm going to turn it around and then finish it. So what I want it to look like, I guess I don't have a finished one here, but I want it to look like those uh, whirls or this one right here. I don't want it to look like that one, because that one doesn't spin well, but I want it to look like that. So I'm looking for that shape. Oh, by the way, and I forgot to mention this, when I had this on here, I usually try to get this diameter to where I want it. And I didn't even measure it this time. I, 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 I can guarantee it's pretty close, but let's just measure it and see. Yeah, it's just under two inches. I'd like it to be maybe another 16th inch diameter, but that's close enough. So when you're doing this, you kind of want to measure and see what you have. OK, now how do you turn it around? I'm going to turn it around. Oh, and I didn't do another thing, and I'm going to do that, because that's kind of an important thing. No. I'm going to put a finish, I'm going to finish it at the end, the whole, once it's all glued together. One thing I do is um, if you uh, take a little bit of material out right there at the hole, on the edge of the hole, it makes it a lot easier to put it together later. So just, just a tiny bit. So I'm just going to take a little bit out. That's it. Just makes it easier. OK, now I'm going to turn it around. Now, when you turn it around, you need to somehow chuck it in using that hole, because that hole is what's true. I mean, you're not changing that hole. You can change the surface, but you can't change the hole now. So here's what I used to use. I've gone through three iterations of this. Actually, John Solberg's uh, had some good ideas on this. Here, I made this. So this is threaded. The thread's on here. I drilled a hole in here, and I put just a little metal pin in there. Um, John, you had those. Did you? Did you? Oh, no wonder I couldn't see him. So you can get these at. Uh, Denton bolt. Okay. These are just quarter-inch pins. I'll just pass one around. Yeah, you can drop that, I don't care. So um, what I did is drill the hole, put it in there, and it does pretty well. Um, but the problem is when you, when you feel it here, it's just a slight vibration. And, and any vibration, you think about a vibration down here, a small vibration could make a large vibration here. So you want to minimize this vibration. So that's, that was my first attempt, and that worked pretty well. I, I made a lot using this, or ones like this. And then. John Solberg had the idea of why not just use, and I'm not going to unchuck it, but just use a drill chuck. Stick it in, put your pin in there, and use that. It's a good idea. Use that for a while. Problem is, it have a tendency to come out. And it's spinning real fast, and you've got your sharp tool in your hand, and the thing's coming out, and you're, you know, you can kind of get desperate. So, John came up with something better, and that's a collet. You can get these collets at um, what's called the Little Shop, Little Machine Shop. It's in Pasadena, California. You can find it online. And a uh, quarter inch, so you just stick the pin in there, put it in the headstock, and you use just a standard um, draw bar. Yeah, that's just a standard thread. For if it has the threads on it. Yeah, yeah, mine didn't, so. Okay, and then you just tighten it in, and uh, you've got a good place to mount this. So 
to work on it. I usually push them in a little bit further than that, but that's okay for tonight. And I don't know if you can see, but it runs pretty true. It's a slight vibration. But if it does vibrate a little bit, not, no big deal, because I'm going to clean it up anyway. So that hole that we drilled is the true hole now. That's going to be the center. We're going to make it the center. Okay. The shape I like is uh, something like that. I think it is like a parabolic shape, if you remember what par parabolas are. And these formulas are all based on parabolas. If you don't make a parabola, you need a different diameter. So, for example, if you make it a, if you made it a cone, you made this straight across instead of the curve, it would be, that'd be about 10% off. So, not a lot, probably. 10% you're okay. Um, it would make it, if you, if you made the same diameter and cut that off, it wouldn't have quite as much moment of inertia, which means it wouldn't spin as long. It'd be easier to spin, it'd spin a little faster, but it wouldn't spin as long. Okay, so I'm just going to do a pull cut here and get the shape. Using the same uh, bowl gouge. Now, I'm trying to take off too much near the edge here. But um, if, it, if you have problems with it uh, spinning in the, on the pin, you can move the tailstock up and put a little pressure on and you're fine then. But I don't need to do that because it's unwell enough. So you just get the shape you want and clean it up a little bit. I'm just doing a shear scrape here. Not too bad. I'm sorry? Yeah, I do these all across. I have made a few that are ingrain. Um, I don't like to drill the ingrain, though, because it's going to want to run with the grain more, I think. I think it's better to do it this way. I think other spindle makers do it the other way, but um, I don't know that for sure. Just trying to clean it up a little bit. And then uh, I'll be able to make it so I don't have to Makes it so I don't have to sand as long because when I'm sanding, that's what I'm talking about marketing, and everybody's bored with that. So I'll try to minimize that time. And then I want to go ahead and finish the uh, the hole. So I'll mark the center. And do it just like I did before. Start with what's this called? Center punt? Center? Center drill. Center drill. I'm as bad at remembering names of things as I am remembering names of people. Okay, so let's get it started here. It's a little bit fast, maybe. It's a little bit slow, maybe. And I'll put the drill bit in. I don't like the brad point, because the brad point uh, sharp, it'll tend to follow the grain more. I found it's easier if you use one that's just a regular bit. I don't know, can you see it there? In fact, I've got one that the, the angle here is uh, pretty steep. You know, I mean, it's not, it's closer to perpendicular than it is. And I kind of like it, it seems to work pretty well. Now I don't have to count because um, I'll know when I get to the end because I can't go any further. <laughs> okay, I'll take this out so I don't cut myself. Now I'm ready to sand. So, since I'm sanding, I'm going to talk more about marketing. Um, all right, so I was talking about... Um, if you have, uh, if you're trying to sell, say, bowls, say you want to sell bowls, you want to sell them on Etsy, you're competing with maybe 
I don't know, maybe a thousand other people selling bowls on Etsy. And there's thousands of bowls out there. So um, how do you sell a bowl? How, what do you do to distinguish yourself? Of course, there's some obvious things. You want to make sure your quality is high. Pricing is a problem. I mean, do you price high so that people think they're high quality? And or you price low so that people will want to buy them? My advice is price high. Don't price too low. Um, people will look at it and think that uh, if it's too low, they'll think there's something wrong with it. You'll sell them probably, but you're selling them for not much money, and you might sell just as many with higher price. In fact, Etsy encourages you, if you're having trouble selling something, raise the price. But basically, you know, I don't really have the, I don't have the answer on how to price things. I just, I just don't know. Uh, definitely you want to do high quality because if you sell the first bowl, you want to sell the second bowl. And uh, if you have high quality, you know, people talk, they talk to their friends, they, they give feedback on Etsy. If they give you good feedback, that's a good thing too. You can advertise on Etsy. I used to do that. I haven't done it for at least a year because I haven't needed to. I'll talk about why in a little bit. So um, you can do those things. But I have a different strategy for um, selling bowls or whatever it is you want to sell on Etsy. And that's the strategy that I'm kind of following, not to sell these, but to sell other things, or I'm going to be following. So my strategy is this. You find a niche market. My niche market are these spindles. Not very many people make those. In fact, I know probably most of the people that make very many of them in the world. There's a guy in Australia, a guy in New Zealand, a woman in um, Alabama, a woman in Oregon, another guy in Texas, a couple in England, and maybe a few others. I'm going to tell you in a minute. So, um, um, it's a niche market. So if you get into a niche market, okay, so here's my strategy. You get into a niche market, you sell a bunch of things, you make really good quality, you do the best you can, and you sell a bunch of them. I've sold um, over 400 in the last year. I would have sold more, except that's as fast as I can make them. Right now I have back orders of about 40. And so, and I, in fact, I quit taking back orders until the middle of August until I can get caught up. But what I really want to do is I want to keep making spindles. I enjoy making spindles, but I want to make other things. I want to make boxes, bowls, jewelry holders, things like that. Um, but today, I got a request for somebody from somebody who said that uh, she really likes some of the jewelry holders that I've made in the past, and she'd like to order one. She wants to order it for her mother for her mother's 70th birthday. The key is to get traffic to, through your shop. I've got traffic through my shop now. The traffic is from people that are buying spindles, but they'll buy other things. They have friends that buy other things. For the first six months of uh, this year, um, I've had 21,000 clicks on my, on my shop. So I have a lot of people going through. So I have an opportunity. If I can start making other things I want to sell, bowls, boxes, whatever, um, I'll have enough traffic that I'm confident I can sell them. In fact, everything I had made uh, a year ago most of those things sold to people that were buying spindles. Like I had a box, they liked the box, they bought the box. I had you know, other things. So I kind of think a good strategy is, oh, I didn't get it. I'm going to have to resand that, but I'm not going to do it tonight. Um, so I think a good strategy is to um, find your niche market, get out there, get some sales, get a lot of people coming through in your niche market, and then start putting other things out. And people will buy them. Because you have a reputation then. How do I price what I'm making? OK, um, <laughs> that's a good question. So um, I'm going to defer that. Next, I want to make the shaft. And then when I sand it, I'll talk about that. So remind me when I'm sanding the shaft, and I'll answer that question. No. <laughs> All right, I'll stick with it. I think I have enough time. I want to do it when I was sanding, so I didn't waste the sanding time. But um, basically, um, when I started making them, I kind of looked around to see what others were selling for. And I priced mine. Um, uh, I started low. Um, most, people are, most people that make nice spindles, uh, Tibetan spindles, charge about $40 plus. Um, I sold my first ones for $30. Um, when I sold my first ones, uh, they sold pretty well. Uh, I raised it to $40 in the next month or so. And I've been at $40 since. I'm going to raise them a couple dollars this month, but it's just $40. And that's pretty much what people do. Now, if you're just starting, if you decide you want to make spindles and you put them on uh, Etsy for $40, people may not buy them because they say, well, I don't know this person. I don't know if they make good spindles. So it's not a bad idea to charge $30. They'll think, well, $30, because we didn't have that kind of halfway works, it's still worth buying. 
And then word gets out and you can sell a lot. And I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, next step is uh, I want to make the shaft. So what I start with in the shaft is uh, a blank. This is maple. Um, I want the blank to be uh, um, at least, well, I want it to be a foot long um, for a standard size, uh, a Tibetan spindle. And it should be square of a prox at least 5 eighths. 5 eighths is a little marginal. Um, the problem with it making it 5 eighths is when you're, when you're truing it, getting it around, it's going to vibrate and it's just hard to do. So make it at least 5 eighths. 3 quarters is nice. You can make it 3 quarters or more, that's better. But if you have expensive wood, you might want to make it less. OK, so I'm going to mount it. You can do it one of two ways. You can either put it on centers, make it round, and then put it in a chuck. And that's the way I always used to do it. But then John told me I was being stupid. He didn't put it that way, but I was being stupid. If you make it square, you can um, just mount them in a chuck. What do you call pins? Pin jaws. And it works really well. Now, I'm going to make both the tip and the shaft out of this. So um, I can put it in a ways, and the tip will be the material that's inside here. I only need the shaft out here. So that should be OK. I actually make three different sizes of these things. For the 12-inch ones, I. I want to make sure that I have at least 10 inches showing here. Oh, I was going to do something I forgot to do it, but it doesn't matter. What I do at home is I use a, a one-foot tool rest here, and I have it marked. I have a zero, a minus a half, and then I have a nine and a half mark. OK, so I put it up here, put the zero about right there. The minus a half is over here somewhere. Nine and a half is over here somewhere. And that tells me what size I'm going to make it, so I don't have to do any measurements. But do we have a longer? My shop name, it's, um, I was going to be a wise guy and say, well, I never named my uh, shop where I have my lathe. But um, my Etsy shop is Neil Brand, N-E-A-L-B-R-E-N-D, -E all one word. So if you go to Etsy and do a search on Neil Brand, you'll find it. OK. Um, yeah. OK, I'm going to start with uh, my tail. Without a point, I don't want a point to start with, and I'll tell you what the point of that is in a minute. But. So I'm just using a standard uh, live center, no point. Okay. So uh, tighten that up a little bit. I'm going to use the roughing gouge and get it round to start with. I don't know if I like this rest or not, but I'll give it a try. Yeah. I had a ruler. Here it is. Let me just make sure I've got this about right. Yeah, that's about right. So I make three different sizes. The 12 inch ones, I make nine inches long here from the tip to, uh, to uh, where it fits into the uh, whirl. For, uh, I make ones that are, uh, I'm sorry, those are 11 inch long. I also make them about 10 inches long and I cut it back an inch, so I make eight and a half inches. And then I also make one I call pocket spindles. Those are eight or nine inches long. I make those seven, seven and a half inches. Okay, but this one I'm going to make regular size. So I just start. Moving it out. Okay, I'm going to make it in this orientation like this. So there's going to be a point here, and be a tenon over here. So this is going to be narrower than up here. So I want to start making it look like that.
okay, yeah, I'll get a little bit more. Now, when you're, when you're choosing your uh, blanks, you want to make sure that both blanks, both for the whirl and for the shaft, that they're really dry. If they're wet a little bit, when they dry, they're going to warp, and you're not going to have a good spindle. So you want to make sure they're really dry. For this, it's really good to have straight grain because it's going to make it a lot easier to get, and it's going to be less likely to warp. Uh, this is fairly straight grain, but I want to make sure I get this perfect, as perfect as I can. So what I'm going to do is, uh, what happens is you're cutting, as you're cutting material away, there's internal stresses. And so um, when you, you're going to release some of those stresses, and it's not going to be quite as true as it was when you first started sometimes. So what I like to do, let me get it just a little bit further. When I get about this point, in order to correct that, what I do is I first look and see how, if it's bad. It's not bad. A little bit of vibration, but it's pretty good. But now what I'm going to do, instead of using this, I'm going to use a point. And that should be right at the center then. Should be. <laughs> so I'm using a, a step center. This has a little spring load so that I can vary the pressure a little bit with that. You don't have to use that, but it makes it a little bit easier, I think. Now this, I should have trimmed this up first before I did this because it's kind of rough there. So what I'm going to do is just put a little sandpaper on it so that, uh, so that this doesn't push in one of those little ridges. I should have done that first, but I didn't think about it. So I'll just uh, sand. I guess when I'm sanding, I'm supposed to talk about marketing. Um, I got started making these because somebody asked me to make one. And I'm going to talk in a minute about why they asked me to make it and tell you why that's relevant to marketing. That's pretty good. OK. Okay, so now just kind of carefully put it up there and kind of watch this as you do it. Make sure it doesn't move. I don't think it did. I think it's okay. Okay, now, with a little bit of luck, when I get it off, it'll be perfect. Or it won't be perfect, but it'll be good enough. All right, so now at this point, I'm going to switch over and use um, a paint can opener, also known as a skew chisel. Um, I never used to use these, but I started using it on, on, on these spindles because it really does do a good job. So let's see if I can keep from screwing up too badly with this. I need to move this. Because I kind of want to come over the top with this hand here to help stabilize things, keep it running true. And then I put my thumb against here, and I just run the length. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a fair amount of vibration here. See that? So I need to get that vibration out. Just take a little bit off at a time. Maple turns really nice. I probably should come out here a little bit on this. So let me just kind of get this in a little bit better. Okay, and I'm going to get some up here off. is a maximum diameter of about, I don't know, somewhere between 3 eighths and a half an inch. I don't measure, but I just try to make it look good. Also depends on the wood. If you have a wood like ebony, which is very dense and um, pretty strong and hard, you can make the diameter a little bit smaller. This is maple. It's not nearly as dense, so I can have a little bit bigger diameter. If I use holly, holly's one I use quite a bit. Holly's not as strong. I make a bigger diameter for holly. Down at this end, I want to come 
pretty much to a point. I don't want to part it off yet, but I want to get it pretty close. A variety of places. Um, I get some on eBay. I get some from a place in Michigan called Cook Woods. There's a place in California called um, Eisenbrand. I can remember it because the brand part. There's, uh, uh, what's the one? Gilmer, which is in Oregon, I think. Um, Cocobolo Incorporated in Florida, which I'm not going to use anymore because I don't know if you notice that I'm kind of red here because I've been turning Cocobolo. I'm going to have to quit doing that. Here and here. Um, so, a variety of places. I get some from Wood World occasionally. Okay, I'm going to get this a little bit thinner here. And that's good enough for now. Now, what I want to do is think about this, the design on it, how I want the design. So, of course, the tip will be here, the top tip-top. Um, here, this will be the tenon. Well, I'll cut that down. This will be the end of the, the bottom end of the spindle. And let's go ahead and make it, yeah, be shaped like this one. Let's see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, a bead here, a bead here, a bead at the end, a kind of a long bead here, a long bead here, and then kind of a half bead there. So that's, that's my goal. Now, I don't measure. I just you know, mark it where I think it looks good. So I'm going to put a small bead here at the end. And I'm going to bring kind of a V coming here, coming down to that point, come back up, put a bead there, and I'll put a bead there. OK? So um, I'm going to go back and use the, this thing for part of it, only a little bit of it. So. Uh, I'm going to start kind of at this end where there's not much support, and then I'll work my way up here. So I like this shape below this or above this uh, top bead, where it's a little smaller diameter here. It comes out a little bigger diameter, and then it tapers down to a point. Actually, I'm going to bring it out a little bit more. No, good question. There's no functional considerations in my design. Now, my design does uh, prevent people from doing one thing that, they, that some spinners like to do. Um, when you get this wrapped with yarn, what some people do is they'll take a straw, and they'll split the straw, and they'll push the straw over this, you know, kind of wrap it so it just fits over there, and push it over, push it all the way to the bottom, then they can pull the straw off, and all the wool comes off, and they have it ready, you know, ready to do whatever they're going to do with it. You can't do that with my design, because I have these beads where it would hit. Most people don't do that, so I don't worry about it. Um, somebody tried it with my spindle once, and I asked her, I said, oh, should I, do I need to change my design? She said, no, don't worry about it. It's just I was being stupid. So I, I, this, I think this adds something to the design to have, to have some detail on the shaft. But keep in mind, by the way, spinners call this a naked spindle. And this one's a dress spindle. Once they're dressed, it doesn't matter what you have underneath. You can't see it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But I, I think it adds something to it, and people seem to appreciate it. So I always add some kind of design. I don't always add this design, but something along these lines. So I'm going to make kind of an elongated bead here. You don't want to take off too much, because you don't have a lot of support here. Nice light cuts. Everybody has their own design. Except there's another guy in Denton that makes them very similar to the way I make it. <laughs> um, they all look very similar. Um, here's, a, here's a book I was going to talk about in a little bit on uh, support spindling. This, uh, this spindle, it's uh, Holly and Ebony. I didn't make that one. I wish I would have. It's a nice one. I made one similar. But that one's made by a guy in uh, Maryland. Um, called the Spanish Peacock. And um, if you look through here, you can glance through this later if you want, you can see a, a bunch of different Tibetan spindles, and um, you can see the differences between them. But most of them look pretty much the same. I sold to one person in California. I just had a, there it is. To one person in California, I sold 22, 20 spindles. And she has over 100. 
So people collect them. I mean, I can't believe she's even spun on all of them, but I'm, I don't complain. <laughs> Let's see if I can move this a little closer. It'll be easier to get a good. Oops. You should never move the tool rest with the, spin, with the laser anymore. Okay, this is not easy here because you don't have much support. So you have to be really real careful. I don't like this because it, uh, it's resting on the back instead of the front of this. I'm going to move, I'm going to use the other tool rest. Yeah. It's a different. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead and put this bead in if I can. Not too bad. Clean that up with this just a little bit. Notice I'm not trying to turn that little bead with the uh, skew chisel. John might, but I wouldn't. And notice I'm putting my finger back here to help support it because um, you don't have much support here. That's pretty thin piece of wood there. Okay, well, I'm not doing a great job, but it's, it'll work. Oh, this tool, sorry. This is a scucci gouge. Basically, it's um, um, a steel rod. And what you do is you touch this surface on a grinder to get a flat up here. And then you sharpen it just like you would a gouge. You know, you put it in your um, jig and just kind of you know, do the sharpening. And it works great. I, I used to use a detail gouge to do the same thing. And it works well too, but I just like this better. And this is cheaper. <laughs> Let's see, let me just clean it up just a touch. Good. Okay, now I want to put another bead here. So I'll cut in this way. A little bit more to make it a little more symmetric. Let's see if I can get it here. This this may get in the way. I may have to use something else, but yeah, that's pretty close. I'll use this instead. I'm gonna cut this down a little bit. I want to make a bead here. Not bad. And now I want to cut this down to that line. And now I want to cut this. We'll start here about where the bead is, cut over, then bring it down. getting easier now because I'm closer to the support, so it's a lot easier to do the cuts. Now at the end here, I just want to do a tiny little bead. That's all right. Maybe a little smaller would be better, but that's okay. And then what I like to do is get back and look at it and ask myself, the shape's right. I don't like the shape. Can you see the shape pretty well? Can, can you kind of zoom in on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, Let's see, I have something dark to put behind it. You can see it better. What's wrong with the shape? Anything? You like the shape? What's that? The last bead? Oh, this one right here? This one. Yeah, yeah, it could, be, it could probably be improved a little bit. I'm going to sand it, and it'll probably come out in the sanding, so I'm not going to worry about that. Here's what I don't like. Look at this shape along here. It, it comes up, which is an, it's a nice curve coming up. I'm feeling a little vibration there, but it'll probably stand up. Anyway, it'll come up here, and it's coming down, but I really don't like this area in here. I think it's too thick. Do you agree with that? Flick it. You flick it at the very
very top. You want it really thin there. You want it to come to a point. You want this to be like eighth inch or less, right here at the top. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's how these are done. They're flicked right at the top. Um, the person that wrote this book um, suggests you use three fingers to flick. So you use three fingers and a thumb and flick like that. So if you just use one finger, your finger gets tired. Use three, works better. Anyway, I think it's a good idea to take a little more out right there. So at this point, it's a good idea to look at the shape. Try to get the best shape you can, um, something that's kind of aesthetically pleasing and nice curve to it. So I'm going to take out right in there. But you sure don't want to take a very big piece out because, or a very big uh, cut out because you have very little support there. I'm using my left hand to help stabilize it. And you don't want to squeeze too hard with your left hand or you'll wind up with burns. But you'll figure that out. Okay. I kind of like that. Good enough. So the next thing, I want to put a tin in here. Uh, the hole here is a quarter of an inch, so I need a quarter inch tenon. So what I do first is uh, use the parting tool and get it close. I, I'm going to sand it in a little bit. I don't sand it yet. I'll, I'll, I will in a minute, though. And then I'll talk about marketing. Oh, by the way, one thing I should do, um, you always want to kind of look at this, look at your whirl. I didn't do this, and I should have. <laughs> you want to make sure that this fits well on here. And this one, I didn't do that, and it's not going to fit well. But that's OK. You get the idea. So in this one, um, it's pretty, I, I don't have much of a flat there on top. If I had a bigger flat, this would work better, because it should be at least that wide, the width of this, which it's not. So it'll kind of hang over a little bit, but it'll be OK. I'm not going to sell this one. OK, so I'm going to get it down to close to a quarter of an inch. After you've done a few hundred of these, you can kind of guess pretty close what a quarter of an inch is, but not close enough to rely on it. That's a little more than a quarter of an inch. Now, there's a special tool called a tenon maker. And I have one of them here. It has another name. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or somewhere to buy it, it's marked under the name wrench. OK, so I got a quarter inch wrench. And all I did is I sharpened the top. I just ground this down to where it's sharp. And so I don't do any measuring. So uh, just kind of. The key is make sure that you're holding the bottom up against all the time. If you let the bottom go down a little bit, you're going to make it too small. So you see how I'm doing? I'm just holding the bottom against. and. Most tools, you're putting a little pressure down. This, you're putting the pressure up, because you want to make sure that you don't let it tip down. Well, a quarter inch wrench isn't a quarter of an inch, because it's got to go on a quarter of an inch nut. And Glenn probably knows this better than me, but I'm assuming the nut's the quarter of an inch, not the wrench. Isn't that right? So the wrench has to be a little bigger. Well, that's perfect, because this doesn't do a great job of, uh, of cutting. It's a little bit rough. So what you do is just trim it just, just a slight bit. So I'm just going to go in here and just clean it up a little bit quarter of an inch. Now, I, this is uh, a parting tool that I made. This is uh, a bandsaw blade. And I just attached that to a handle. And it's really nice for doing small cutoffs, things like that. What I'm going to use it for right now is, if you look at this, I don't, you probably can't see it. You know, it zoomed in, it'd be hard to see. But if you look at this, this isn't perfectly square. This cut's not square in there. I'm going to undercut a little bit. That way, when I insert it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch on the outside rather than somewhere inside and keep it, you know, makes, makes it so you don't have a gap. So what I do is I just come in here and I just, just take a, just a tiny little bit out and stop maybe just a little bit short of the quarter inch. And I can do that because, remember, I took a little bit out here. So if that's a little bit big there, that's OK. It'll just fit right in there. OK, so that should fit in perfectly, I hope. Now I want to part this off. At this point, I'm going to relieve some pressure. Oh, and this is a good time to see if we did a good job. Yeah, it's vibrating a little bit more than I like, but it's acceptable. That, it, this could still be a really good spindle. No. I'm going to sand in a little bit. So I part this off just by uh, 
making this come to a point. Not bad. What you really want to see is so that when you look at this, you can't even tell it's turning. You can see it vibrating there, at least in the front row. I don't. Yeah, you can see it up there. You can see it's vibrating, but it's not bad. That, that's going to be good enough. And there's ways to tune that later that I'm going to talk about. Now I sanded. So now I have to talk about marketing. Okay, I'm going to tell you now how I got started. Um, a year ago, I was making. I, mean, I sold quite a few tops on Etsy. I probably, when I say quite a few, I don't mean hundreds. I mean fives. <laughs> I maybe sold 15, 20 tops. And um, I kind of decided that I was going to try to make the best top I can, try to make the best ones on Etsy if possible. So um, I was looking at things like spin time. I wanted to make sure that my spin times were over a minute. I wouldn't sell it if it wasn't over a minute spin time for a top. I was going for two minutes whenever possible. Um, they had to look great. Um, I was really concerned about quality. Then about a year ago, a woman contacted me and said that she had a sport spindle, a Tibetan spindle, and the person that made it had died, and she was looking for somebody else to make one for her. Um, and, I said, and she asked if I could do it. She said, the reason I picked you is because I saw your spindles, or I saw your tops. And she said she looked at a lot of people's tops, and she liked mine. She really liked mine. So she wanted me to make a spindle for her. And I said, sure, I can do that, no problem. What's a spindle? <laughs> what is it? What does it look like? Can you send me a picture? So she sent me a picture with measurements, and I basically just copied it. I did it just, just exactly what the measurements were. I used different wood, so you know, my spin might not have been perfect, but um, I made it. I um, listed it on my Etsy site. Normally, when I list something on Etsy, I list it there, and it Back then, something would sit for a month, two months, three months, six months. Finally, somebody might buy it if I'm lucky. So I listed this thing on a Sunday night. Monday morning, I got up and it was sold because I'd contacted her and told her it was ready to go. But it was sold to somebody else. Now, that's when I realized there was a market for these things. So I contacted her and I said, I'm sorry. I should have reserved it for you, but I never thought I had to reserve it because I thought I didn't think there was a chance it would sell you know, within a month. So. Um, I contact her and apologize, and I'm going to make another one. Um, I'll have it on that night. So in fact, I made six more um, the next day or two, reserved one for her. Those six sold within three or four days. Um, then I started getting feedback from people, and people liked them, but they had complaints about them. I used to put a notch in the top, put a notch right there, and people would make half hitches and use, and drop spindles, I think, use half hitches too. And they kind of make them, use them like uh, drop spindles. But some people didn't want notches. And they said, well, we can make one without a notch. And so then I, what I started doing was I would make them without the notch. I said, if you want a notch, let me know. I'll just put a notch in. It's easy to do. Almost nobody wanted one, so I just quit doing it. I mean, I don't make notch, notches anymore. So I've been making them since. Um, my point there is this. If you want to sell, whatever you want to sell, you can find a niche market and get people well, let me say it this way. If you're looking for a niche market, whatever you're putting on Etsy, put the best you can on there. It's got to be one of the best ones on Etsy. You want to compare with everybody else's? Look at all the bowls if you're selling bowls. If yours aren't as good as other people's, people aren't going to ask you to make something else. But if yours is among the best out there, and somebody wants something that's uh, in a niche market and it's kind of like a bowl, they might ask you. I mean, they may not. I was very lucky. That's an important aspect of this, too. You have to be lucky. Um, but if you do good quality work and you're persistent, I had my stuff on there a year and a, a, year and a half, and I sold 50 things total. I was almost to the point of, well, I'm, it's not worth it. You know, it's just not. But I kept going, and uh, it's worked out. Yeah. A what? I don't know. I mean, if you just cut it off there and just have the shaft. A knitting needle, yeah, probably. It probably could work for one. I, I, I don't knit, so I don't know. I've had a lesson in knitting, but I can't knit. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it would kind of look like one. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of possible niche markets in the fiber business. There's uh, certain spindles. There's a lot of different kinds of spindles. There's Russian spindles. These are Tibetan spindles. There's things called fangs, which are, look like they'd be easy. I've never made one, but basically it's like a cone and a cone together. So you just make it come up and down. That's all there is to it. I have a formula for what the diameter should be, too. <laughs> and um, so you can make those. There are things called lace bobbins. People get a lot of those because when they're making lace doilies, things like that, they have to have a whole bunch, maybe a dozen of them or so, and they all have to be a little different. So lace bobbins, that's something that can be made. There's a lot of stuff that you could make um, with fiber. Well, depends how you count it. If you count just the turning of the spindle, I can make one in, one of these I can make in an hour if I'm using cherry and maple. If I'm using ebony and something more exotic, it might take an hour and a half because they don't cut as nice, they don't turn as nice. But usually I can make them in an hour and a half at most. Now that doesn't include finding the wood, it doesn't include drying the wood, it doesn't include, the big thing that is annoying is once you make it, you have to list it on Etsy, which is not bad. I mean, I can list it in about 10 minutes. That includes taking pictures. I take five pictures, post the pictures, write the description. But since I'm selling the same thing, I just copy the one and copy it in and make the changes. So it's going to go pretty fast. But then when you sell it, you've got to uh, sometimes talk to the people. You know, they'll have a question about it and stuff. You have to box it up. You have to ship it. So probably it's another at least half an hour, 45 minutes, other than the time, the fun time um, doing it. So I might have two hours in it total. Okay, so I've got it sanded. I probably should stop and look at it, but I don't want to, so I'm not going to. Um, what's that? Shipping is pretty convenient with Etsy. What, what you do is um, uh, you list things on Etsy. They buy it. Usually they buy it through PayPal. When they buy it through PayPal, you go to PayPal, and you can click on a button, and it goes to UPS or United States Postal Service, USPS, either one. And then you just fill out, it's already got the address there. You tell it the weight, size of the box, hit the button. It prints out the postage, it prints out a label that you put in your box, and you just give it to the mail carrier. So it's very simple. And it's, it's actually cheaper to ship it that way than it is if you take that same box and take it to, uh, what's, what's the place called, pack and, pack and Ship and have them do it. You save about 50 cents or a dollar over that. So it's a good deal. Um, Etsy does charge. Etsy charges, um, oh, I'm trying to remember. I think it's around 3.5%. They charge 20 cents to list. Whatever you list is 20 cents. And then they charge, once it sells, they charge you, I think it's 3.5%. Does anybody remember? Is that right? And then PayPal will charge you 3.9%. So you lose uh, 8% or so, but it's a bargain because there's, it saves you so much work, you know, and it's just so slick and so convenient. And it's where everybody goes to look for things. I wouldn't do it any other way. Okay, I'm going to part it off now. So I'm just going to clip it here. So I charge $5 for shipping in the U.S. A little more for other countries. Okay, here's what happened. I made it too long. It goes in nice and tight, but I got a little gap there. So. What I have at home, I wish I had here, was a little um, belt sander. I just hold up the belt sander, and a second later it's not. So now what I'm going to have to do is uh, sand it, I suppose. So that means I can tell you more about marketing. What else do I want to say? No, oh, my paper dropped. Yeah, um, I use, uh, I've used Mesquite and Bodart. I've used... Uh, um, Hackberry, <laughs> got from John Beasley. Um, what else have I used local? Uh, I used some from Indiana, where I'm from, that my brother-in-law cut down. It is some uh, spalted sycamore that he had, and um, cherry. This cherry is from Indiana. What do you do with your wood from? Do you find it dry enough? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I have a moisture meter. I always, I try to remember to always check. I, the coca bola I just made, I didn't check. So when I made these, I made, uh, one day I made the whirls. Um, next day I came back and I was going to make the shafts put in. I made a shaft, I stuck it in, and it was a good tight fit. 
And I was lucky, I was really glad because I thought I'd taken a little too much off. It was a good tight fit, but it didn't spin well at all when I tried it. And uh, and I realized it just wasn't round anymore. So it was too wet and it moved a little bit overnight even. What mark does not fit the <laughs> As little as possible. Um, for the whirls, if it's under like 16%, I'm okay with that. For the shaft, if you want it probably drier than that, you probably want it, I don't know. Air dry it, yeah. I have some sitting around. I have some black and white um, ebony that uh, is notorious for being wet. And I'm going to wait a couple years on that probably. But a lot of times I'll contact the, the company and ask them if it's dry, you know, what the moisture content is. Where did I put the ebony? Okay, that fits nice. And notice it's a nice, light, nice tight fit. You can, you can, can you feel that when I'm pushing? <laughs> I didn't measure a thing. What happens if the eight nine volt extender to uh, try to flip the wood so it flips instead of taps, you get a, a better misalignment for a whole lot better. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. It's a great idea because it's going to split right along great with the grain. Oh, that's a great idea. No, I never. It's a lot better than when it's flipped. Yeah, that's a, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good idea. Do you use a bone in the Excel? Yeah, I have it on Excel. Do you want, me to, do you want it? We can put it on the website. I'll put the. I have a. I have a spreadsheet that has. Um, uh, first, you can get the density by measuring the um, length, width, height of the. You know, I just cut these little squares, measure those, weigh it, and this. I have a little. Here's this is a great little scale. You can get this at Harbor Freight for ten bucks, and um, you do it in metric. I do it all in centimeters, centimeters and grams. So I do that, and I put that in my spreadsheet, and it tells me the density. And then I have a little area below that where I put the density in, and um, I can put what the width I want for the for the whirl. And typically, keeps moving. Oh, here's my whirl. So <laughs> typically, this width is somewhere between three quarters of an inch and an inch, or between 20, uh, two centimeters and 2.5 centimeters. So I put in what the width I want. I put in the density. It calculates the formula. It tells you the diameter. Okay, then. After I do that, in fact, let's do the other. There's another formula below there I haven't talked about. I probably should talk about that. What I want, what I'm looking for, if. No. <laughs> yeah. I want it back in a minute because I'm going to have to glue it up and stuff. So I need a ball glue and pass now. Just, uh, I'll need it in a minute. Okay, so what I do is um, once I finish this, I don't always do this because I've done enough of them, I don't worry too much about it, but it's not a bad idea to weigh it. This one weighs 16.8 grams. I don't know if you can see that, but 16.8 grams. Now I use this formula. And what I want is I want 360 to be equal to the mass times the diameter squared. The mass is, what did they say? 17. And the diameter was um, 40, uh, sorry, 4.7. So somebody have a calculator. What's 4.7 squared times uh, 16 point, whatever that was? Now, when I'm teaching my class, somebody always pulls a calculator out and does this calculation. Anyway, I want it to be three. So what is, let's see. It's OK, so it's pretty close, actually. What is it, 340? 340? I want 360. That's close enough. <laughs> what would you say it was, 360? OK, this is 47. 47 squared is just over, or 4.7 squared is just over 20. So 20 times 16, 30. Yeah, it's, it's pretty close. I want it to be 360, but if it's 320, that's fine. How about 353.4? Perfect. But that, <laughs> but if you make it a parabola, and if that formula works, then you've got one that's going to work great. OK. Um, I'll finish in a minute then. All right, I just need to make a tip. Tip's really fast. And then I want that back and we'll glue them together because there's a little trick you want to do at the end uh, to make it a little bit better. Well, I used to use CA glue, but on this one, when I was messing with it, it got loose. And so I thought, I'm not using CA glue anymore. And I knew this one was a little bit loose when I started with it. It didn't have a good tight fit like this one. Now I just use. Um, Yellow glue. This is type on too, but and that works great. Okay, let me go ahead and finish this up here. So I want to make the tip. So 
So what I want to first do is get this diameter down to, uh, you know, something like that. So I'm just going to use the parting tool. That's it. We can part it off. <laughs> Maybe not quite. Okay, so this tip is important. This tip's got to be the right place. If that tip's off a fraction of a millimeter, it's going to wobble. So you want to make sure that you get a good sharp point on that. Okay, there's the point. Now what I'm going to do is shape it. I'll shape it kind of like that one. It's been uh, like that one. So I'm going to put a little, um, a little round here at the tip, a little bead. What's important is that you have a tip here at the bottom that's sharp, right in the center. Everything up above that, whatever you want. I've done different ones. This I've kind of settled in on this one. I don't always do this one, but this is the most common one I'm using now. Yeah, I think it's better to make it short for a couple of reasons. One is um, people like them 11 inches or shorter usually. If you make this long, you're going to make less distance here. You can't, put as much, you can't put as much fiber on it. So I think these need to be short. I try to make them a half an inch or so, whatever that is. So yeah, I, I think it's better to keep them short. What was that? I do. I tell, I tell the weight. When I, when I sell them, I tell, I tell them the length, I tell them the weight, and I tell them the diameter of the whorl. I know your weight for the fiber, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. I, I always thought people wanted to know the weight just because... Um, they wanted, they thought it'd spin better with certain weights, and in fact, people do. And I'll talk about that in a minute when I'm sanding this. What's that? Yeah, I do. I've, uh, I make holly ones sometimes. I make everything out of holly, and um, uh, I'll texture and paint, put metallic paint on, sort of like what Sharon's done on some. I guess you didn't do the demo here, you did it other places, but maybe she'll do it here someday. And um, I also do, um, uh, I, I may have shown some, well, uh, that platter I have in the ex exhibit has uh, bands and bricks kind of, and then I color the bricks and I do that on the, on the whorl up along here. Okay, let me just go ahead and finish this. I'm almost done here. Let me just smooth that out a little. That's good enough, sort of. It. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Okay, I need to get this down to a quarter of an inch, so get it pretty close and get the tenon maker. And then uh, clean it up. And I think maybe I ought to take a little bit more off here. That's good enough. Now, sanding, I start with 400 here. You don't really have to sand with very coarse grit because I just keep it going fast, and this doesn't take any time at all. And so I want to tell another story. When uh, I was first starting this, or a while after I started, but not long after, a woman contacted me from Georgia. She said she gives classes in uh, uh, spinning, and she likes to have spindles from all the spindle makers so she can show her students the different styles and they can see what they like. So she wanted to buy one from me and I sold her one. She um, got it, wrote back to me and said, um, it's very pretty, you know, you really did a nice job on it. Except one problem, you can't spin on it. She says, way too heavy. Okay, so if that were to happen to you, you wanted to make these things, what would you do? 
That's the right thing to do. Make another one. I just made it. I said, okay, I'll make another one and send it to you. So I knew the weight of that when I sold her. I think it was like two grams, or two, uh, sorry, two ounces, maybe 40, 50 grams, 56 grams, maybe, I don't know. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make it quite a bit lighter. I made it around um, maybe, I don't remember, maybe 35 grams, something like that. I sent it to her. She sent back and said, this is one of the best minerals I've ever had. So now, um, when she gives classes, she has two kinds of spindles that she has for her students. She has mine and one other spindle maker. So I get a lot of business from her because of that. And I thought it was very nice of her to contact me and let me know that the spindle wasn't what she wanted. And I was able to correct it. And because of that, I've gotten a lot of sales. Okay. In fact, that's the woman that wrote this book. Legal Spins supported. Her online name is Flegal. Um, if you want to read about support spindling, this is a great book. You can contact her directly, and on that sheet that I've handed around, it, it talks about how to do that. One more thing I want to talk about. I know I'm going kind of long here. But one more thing I want to talk about is marketing these things. There's a website um, other than Etsy that you probably should know about if you want to make these or other fiber things, and that's called Ravelry. Ravelry.com. It's on the bottom of that sheet. And basically, there's a number of threads there. Okay, so I've got this. Let's see if it works. Okay, this is a good tight fit. Now, at, at home, what I do is, when I get to this point where I have to push it in all the way, I go over here to the side of the cabinet, and I push it in here because this is fiberboard. <laughs> uh, no, it's MDF, and uh, it's very soft. But I don't have that here, so I don't want to do it that. So I'll do it on another piece of, of um, wood. Let's force it in. Now, the moment of truth, put this in, and I like to spin it and see what it looks like. Terrible. That's terrible. I, I wouldn't sell that. But here's what you do. You turn it, try it again. No. Nope. Terrible. So what I'm going to have to do is do one last step, and I don't know if I'm going to complete this or not because I may not have time because you guys probably want to go home sometime tonight. But let me just tell you what you can do. Basically, you go ahead and glue this in, which I'm not going to do right now, but you could. And I use CA glue for that because that's not going to come out. You reconnect um, this. In fact, I have a mini lathe that I have one of these connected to all the time. I just go over to that one and use it. Remount this thing. You see the wobble? Can you see it? Can you zoom in on that, Mike? I can feel it there. You can feel just just a little bit of wobble. So what I do is I just clean it up. I just make it so it runs true. You don't always have to do this, but I do more often than I like. OK, and then I would sand it. I'm not going to sand it now, because I don't have any more stories to tell. And uh, I might shape it a little better than that, too. But anyway, I want to just get the idea here. Now let's try it. Yeah, that's a little better. So what you do now is you just, this is fixed now, but you can rotate this one. And you rotate it until it spins as best as you can make it. Yeah, this one may just not be a good one. Once in a while that happens. I was hoping it wouldn't happen tonight, though. Yeah, that's, that's, that's acceptable. That's acceptable. Let's see if I can make it a little better. You can. You can, yeah. Yeah, I do. I'll save this. I'll save them. OK. Anyway, what I do now is once I get it tuned, this one's not bad. I mean, I'd have to think about that before I decide to sell it. What I do is I just mark it by putting tape on. I could do it on the bottom, too. 
But uh, the idea is you want to mark it so when you glue it, you know where to, where to insert it. So let's put a little mark here and a little mark here so that they line up. And then I glue it. Mm, didn't bring anything to put the glue on. I'll just put it on this little blank here. And I did have a toothpick, but I have no idea where I put it. So I'll just use the end of this. Oh, wait a minute, is that the right? Yeah, this is the bad one. OK. Oh, I, I don't need it now. Thank you, though. So I just put a dab on there and uh, put it in. And now you kind of have to be careful. You have to work fast because uh, the, the moisture in there um, makes the wood expand. So it fits even tighter. And that's why you want to have the marks there so you can get it right to where you want it. And you test it again. It's wobbling a little bit, but not too bad. Maybe I can fix it a little bit better. I don't want to twist it anymore because it's too tight and I'm likely to break it. OK, that I would not sell. That's vibrating too much. So I've just showed you how not to make a smith level. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not sure what went wrong exactly. Um, it could be the, um, you know, it could be the shaft is off a little bit. It could be that the density inside this wood is, is off. Sometimes that happens. Probably not. It usually doesn't help much to take the tape off. I used to think maybe it would, but let's try it. But even if you make one like this, don't throw it away. You can still use it. This, this is fine for spinning. It's just not good for selling. Um, if you spin it in a bowl, it spins better, too. Yeah, it's still jumping around. But I just sold two, one that was like this and one that uh, the finish wasn't good on it. Because a woman contacted me and said, if you have seconds that you don't want, um, I'd be willing to take them because I think they spin fine. And so I sold them for half price to her. And I said, as long as you don't resell them or tell anybody about it, I'm fine. So that's my demonstration. Any questions? Ravelry, yeah. Oh, yeah, let me say a little bit about them. Ravelry is a site for uh, people that uh, are in the fiber arts, um, that do spinning, knitting, crocheting, that sort of thing, spinning. Um, and there are a number of threads there. Um, there's three main threads you ought to be aware of. It's on that sheet. One's called um, Spindle Eye Candy, I think. One's called Support Spindlers. One's called Spindle Makers, I think all one word. There's several other. Um, threads also are forums. And each forum will have a list of a bunch of threads. So there's one thread in Spindle Eye Candy called uh, Show Your Neil Brand Eye Candy. And, I, and when people buy spindles from me, a lot of times I'll take a picture of it or they'll use the picture that I posted. They'll post it on there, and then they'll post it naked, and then they'll post it dressed. And um, it's really kind of nice. I mean, I like to see them dressed. Um, oh. Yeah, I was going to do that, and I ran out of time. So once I get it to this point, whichever one it is, um, I use the Buell buffing system. I just buff it, and that's all I do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>